Moving on to this lecture, this is about one of my greatest heroes, Sir Ernest Shackleton, and I've named the lecture Beyond Endurance, and I think you'll understand why. So Shackleton was born in February 7, 1874 in County Kildare in Ireland. Um, he was the second of ten children, the first of two sons in the family. His brother Frank later got into a little bit of trouble. He was a prime suspect in the theft of the Irish Crown Jewels, a crime that has never been solved. Um, but when Shackleton later became famous, the chief detective from Scotland Yard in charge of that investigation later cleared Frank Shackleton of any wrongdoing at that time. Um, at the age of 10, the father moved the family to London. The father had initially been a farmer in Ireland and then he'd taken the exams and passed all those to become a doctor and he thought there'd be more opportunities for, um, uh, for becoming wealthier in London. But the family never did become very, very wealthy at all. And at the age of 16, because the family couldn't afford to send young Ernest to a maritime college, he started an apprenticeship at sea before the mast. Now that means that back in those days, sailing ships, the main mast was in the centre of the vessel, and if you were to sling your hammock forward of the mast, um, before the mast, it meant that you were either a junior sailor or that you were a cadet officer in this case. If you had your, your, you slung your hammock after the mast, that was the officer country or where the senior sailors used to, to put their, their um, hammocks as well. So he started off very, very low in the pecking order. But over the next few years, he studied, he did all these studies, he traveled all around the world with the, um, the British merchant Navy, and uh, at the age of 20, he passed his exams to become a second mate. He kept on studying, and four years later, he passed all of the qualifications to become a master mariner, which meant that he could take command of any British commercial vessel uh, anywhere in the world. But it was a, a role that he never actually took up in, uh, in real life. Now, in 1900, he was part of a, a voyage that was taking um, reinforcements to South Africa from England um, as part of the Boer War. He was second mate on this, uh, on this uh, ship, and he met a man, a young army officer by the name of Cedric Longstaff. They became very good friends, and young Cedric uh, gave... Uh, Shackleton a letter of introduction to his father, a man by the name of Llewellyn Longstaff, who was a very wealthy industrialist at the time. When Shackleton met the elder Longstaff, Longstaff was very impressed by the attitude and the demeanour of young Ernest Shackleton, so he in turn wrote a letter of introduction to another man by the name of Sir Clements Markham, who was the president of the Royal Geographic Society at that time. Now, mainly because um, Longs um, uh, Longstaff was the chief financial backer of an expedition that was heading out to Antarctica, young Ernest Shackleton, because of that recommendation, was made third officer on for the Discovery Expedition, part of the National Ar um, Antarctic Expedition. And that, um, that was going to be commanded by a man by the name of Captain Robert Falcon Scott, who obviously becomes famous later on. Now, this is a, a great quote about Antarctica, and probably not one you want to hear right now, considering where we are, but surrounded by a thousand miles of the worst seas uh, in the world, the underbelly of our planet, Antarctica, was never really relatively unknown by, um, by mankind at that time. And the 3, square, sorry, 3 million square miles of Antarctica, there isn't a single tree growing or even a blade of grass anywhere on that continent. And around the continent, you have all the ice flows of Antarctica and around them, as it says, the worst oceans anywhere in the world. And just, I've shown you this before, but just to give you another idea, this is a map of the United States uh, um, the continental United States superimposed on Antarctica. So Antarctica is almost twice as big as the continental US, and as I said, around that you've got all the ice flows as well. Now this discovery expedition, it was... Um, 
It was going down to the Antarctic to be a forerunner for future attempts to get to the pole. It was going to be a scientific expedition as well as, as a, uh, a way of trying to find information about getting to the South Pole. And the officer in charge is this man here, that's Scott, and this is Shackleton, the third officer over here. Now, they departed London in July 1901 and meet, reached McMurdo Sound in Antarctica about six months later. Now, this was not a naval vessel, but Scott was a naval officer and he made everybody on board sign the Royal Navy Discipline Act so that the whole crew was now going to be under the, the, um, the discipline of the Royal Navy, which meant that... Uh, people had to salute officers. Officers were called sir. You, uh, you ate in different areas of the ship, the officers in the wardroom and the other men uh, around other parts of the ship. Now, this was completely foreign to Shackleton, who had been brought up in the Merchant Navy, where things were much more relaxed. So he spent a lot of time with the ordinary sailors aboard the Discovery. Uh, his role on the voyage was to be the supply officer, make sure there was enough supplies and they were in the right place. But he was also the entertainment officer. They put on pantomimes and plays for, for people. But he became the most popular of all the officers on board with the men. But he was also quite popular with Scott. Scott apparently thought fairly highly of, of Shackleton. And when they got to Antarctica, Shackleton was part of the very first balloon flight ever held in Antarctica to try and survey the surrounding countryside of, the, of Antarctica. And he was also involved in the very first sledging party that they sent out to try and learn how to use these dogs. Because remember, these, these Englishmen had never used dog sleds before. None of them had ever been to the Antarctic before. So it was all new to them all. And then he was also selected with, along with a man by the name of Edward Wilson to accompany Scott on this, um, this uh, trek out, trying to reach as far south as possible to try and find out information about getting to the pole. So the three of them set out on the 2nd of November 1902. Now, they did set a record for going the further south. In fact, they went 300 miles further than anyone had ever gone uh, before. But this was still 480 miles from the South Pole, so still a long, long way away. And disaster struck. They um, became quite ill. All of them, because they didn't have any experience, uh, suffered from snow blindness at times. Um, they all got frostbite. But Shackleton also developed scurvy. And that really affected him drastically. He became very, very ill. It got to the point where he could not literally pull his own weight. They had taken dogs with them on this expedition, but they didn't know how to use these dogs, and they actually fed them tainted meat, so one by one those dogs passed away. So now they had to manhaul these sleds them by themselves. So... Um, Shackleton didn't have the strength to be able to pull his sled, so they had to transfer his gear to the other sleds, uh, and on one occasion, for a period of a couple of days, uh, Shackleton himself had to lie on the sled as the others dragged him along. Now, this didn't go down all that very well with Scott and, and uh, Evans, uh, sorry, Wilson, and um, um, they thought that he should have you know, to give them the best chance of survival, he should have sacrificed himself. But um, they were lucky. They actually got, they reached a storage depot, uh, the, the food depot that had been uh, placed there for them, and they were actually able to get back to the base on the 4th of Feb 1903. And this is the way they looked when they got back. Their face is just covered with f from frostbite. Now, there'd been a falling out during this, this trip between Shackleton and Scott, and Shackleton was immediately sent home on the next, um, next ship, whereas Scott and, uh, and Wilson and the others stayed behind uh, to spend another winter in Antarctica to do some more scientific experiments. So when Shackleton got back to England, he was quite the celebrity because he'd, set, he'd been part of this party to set this record of further south. So he started doing speaking engagements and, and newspaper interviews, etc. And he was always extremely complimentary of Scott when he did these interviews. So but he was uh, very, very disappointed when Scott came back and he printed his book or he published his book, The Voyage of Discovery. And in this book, Scott 
um, goes out of his way to criticise Shackleton, saying that um, he had been a burden on the sledging party as they'd gone. Uh, Wilson himself came out, was even more blatant, saying that um, Shackleton should have sacrificed himself to, to um, uh, help the others survive this journey, and they were only lucky that they came across this food depot in the nick of time. So reading between the lines, Scott was very, very critical of Shackleton for not doing that. Other people read that book, of course, and on his next uh, trip down to the South Pole, where five men, along with uh, sorry Scott and four other men, able, were able to reach the South Pole finally, only to discover that Roald Armisen had been there a month earlier and had been the first to reach the South Pole. As they were coming back, a man by the name of Lawrence or Captain Lawrence Titus Oates became ill with frostbite and scurvy, and um, he had read this book he knew what it was expected of him and on his th uh, 32nd birthday during a blizzard uh, in this tent uh, he said I am just going outside and maybe some time he had deliberately gone off to his death so he wouldn't be a burden on the others Scott wrote in his diary which was later found we knew that Paul Oates was walking to his death but though we tried to dissuade him we knew it was an act of a brave man and an English gentleman that was what was expected. Now, the publishing of that book, The Voyage of the Discovery, caused a lot of friction between Scott and Shackleton. But it was always going to work in Scott's favour, not Shackleton, because of Markham. Now, Markham, as I said, was the president of the Royal Geographic Society. He had a lot of pull, a lot of power. He considered Scott to be almost like a son. So if any money or any support was going to go to anyone, it would always go to Scott above Shackleton. He... Shackleton wandered around, was, was, um, didn't have a lot to do for several years. He tried to join the Royal Navy, but they told him, we've got a surplus of officers, we don't need anyone else, so he was rejected. He tried to become a journalist, but he wasn't very good with it, and he, he, uh, he failed in that. He uh, was president of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society for some time, um, but it was really an honorary position It didn't make a lot of money. And then in April 1904, he married Emily Dorman, and they had three children together. And then he tried to go into politics, and during the 1906 general election, he ran as, a, as for a, an office of MP, a member of parliament, but he was unsuccessful. He didn't get elected. And then he met the industrialist, well, William Beardmore, who later became Lord Invercan, and he started working for, um, for Beardmore, be, who was a very wealthy man. And because of his celebrity, um, Shackleton's role was basically to meet and greet people, guests of Beardmore, um, uh, to, to take them out and show them around things, just to be a general dog's body. It wasn't really a responsible position, but it paid a few of the bills. And it gave him contacts with a lot of people as well. But he really wanted to return to Antarctica, and he got the blessing of Beardmore to, to provide some sponsorship money to go back to Antarctica. He needed to raise a lot of money, though. He submitted plans in 1907 to Markham and the Royal Geographic Society saying that he wanted to go back to um, Antarctica. He wanted to try and be the first person to reach the South Pole, but there's going to be a dual focus. He wanted to also to be the first people to reach the magnetic North Pole, which is in a different location altogether. Now, he didn't receive any support at all from the Royal Geographic Society. People expected, even though Scott had not said that he was going back to the Antarctic, people expected that he would. And so Shackleton got no support from the Geographical Society and thanks to Markham, he also got no support from the British governments whatsoever. They thought the budget, or Shackleton proposed that the budget be around about £17,000, which in today's money is about £1.65 million, which is obviously a lot of money for that time. But this was way under. This was very much way under what it should have been. So the whole expedition was, was rushed. It was poorly planned. They had to use obsolete equipment. They took people with them that didn't really have any experience uh, along the way as well. Even the Nimrod, the ship that they picked, was only around about half the size of the discovery that uh, Scott had taken a few years before. 
the final budget ended up being around about three times the size that Shackleton had, uh, had proposed. So he got into a lot of debt and had to pay that debt back over a few more years. And before they left on the 12th of Feb uh, February 1907 aboard the Nimrod, but before he left, he had to make a promise to Scott. There was a lot of pressure put on Shackleton from a lot of different parties to promise Scott that he wouldn't go back to Merdo Sound, where Scott had set up his base before. Even though Scott had not announced any plans to go, uh, he had to make this promise to Scott. But they went to, to Antarctica and they, they sailed into a bay that they expected to be able to use as a base. Uh, ironically, it was a base, it's a bay where um, Armisen later used. But when they went there, they found that the bay was full of whales and it was full of ice. They couldn't land anywhere. So reluctantly, as the weather was closing in, with pressure from his men, he, uh, Shackleton broke his word to Scott and they sailed into McMurdo Sound on the 29th of January. But they set up his campsite or his hut uh, 16 miles from where Scott had uh, originally set up his campsite. Now, as I said, this was a two-pronged attack. They wanted to try and reach the South Pole, but also the Magnetic South Pole. So a group of men went out to try and reach the Magnetic South Pole. They became the first people to uh, summit Mount Erebus, which is the southernmost active volcano in the world. And on the 17th of January, 1909, three men, Dr. Edgeworth David, and uh, another Australian, Douglas Mawson, who later became the most famous Australian Antarctic explorer, and a Scot by the name of Alistair Mackay, reached the magnetic North Pole. So pretty auspicious occasion. So 125 years exactly to the day that the people reached the magnetic South Pole for the very first time. Many of you became uh, Order of the Drake as well, so congratulations. <laughs> But the real, the real goal was to try and get towards the South Pole, get as far as possible towards the South Pole, if not reach the South Pole. So Shackleton chose three men, a man by the name of Wild, Frank Wilde and another two men, Marshall and Adams, and they set off from the hut. They trekked across the, the, um, the Ross Ice Shelf and they came to what's known as the Beardmore Glacier and named that after their chief financial backer, Beardmore. Now, they worked out that they would have to go uh, 1,494 nautical miles to get to the South Pole and back again. And they worked out that it would have to take them 110 days. Now, when they worked that out, it wasn't based on how many miles they would do per day. It was based on how much food that they could carry, and that was all it was about. Uh, they could only carry enough food for 110 days. They set off on the 29th of October 1908 and trekked towards the South Pole. Now, as I said, they named the Beardmore Glacier, and then they reached the part where they'd gone past where Scott had been. They set a record for further south, and they kept on going. And they got within 100 nautical miles of the South Pole. That was one of the goals of Shackleton. He wanted to get within uh, 100 miles, so they went a few miles further, and he got within 97 miles of the pole. But by this time, they had travelled 73 days. They only had food for 110 days, so he had a choice. He could either make a rush for, for, for the pole and try and become the first person to reach the pole, uh, which would probably take six or seven days to do that and then get back to where they were now, or he could just take his wounds and say, let's try again some other time and turn around and go back. He chose option B and he decided to protect his men and turn around and go back. It wasn't all that important to him. But on the way back, they became very, very sick. The rations got down to such a level that they only had two hardtack biscuits each per day to sustain themselves along with some tea that they were able to brew up. And Wild especially became very, very sick during this journey back. One morning, he didn't have the strength to get out of his sleeping bag. So Shackleton gave him one of his uh, hardtack biscuits. So that was half a daily ration uh, to Wild for, for that. 
and Wilde later said all the money in the world, or ever money that was ever minted, would not have bought that biscuit. And the remembrance of that sacrifice will never leave me, and it never did. The fact that he would give up half of his daily ration to help a, a comrade was something that Shackleton often did and uh, was very well respected by his men. And that allowed uh, Wilde to get up and continue on and they were lucky that they made it back. Once again, they found a food depot that had been put out for them. They found that on the 23rd of February. They were able to eat to their heart's content and made it back to the Nimrod on the 28th of February. Uh, and these are the pictures of the four men uh, were there. A few years ago, we, um, we called into Port Chalmers in New Zealand aboard a, a ship. Um, we went on a tour in the morning and then that afternoon we just, my wife and I decided we'd stretch our legs and have a look around. Um, it was a Sunday so there wasn't much open. We went for a drink at the pub and on the way back I noticed that the Maritime Museum was open. I thought, oh great, we'll have a look in there. My wife wasn't quite so enthusiastic about it. Um, and in there they had a, a nice little display about Shackleton and his journey aboard the Nimrod because they'd called into Port Chalmers on the way down and on the way back from Antarctica. And um, as I said, I was looking around, having a, a pretty good time. My wife, Lee, was, was following me about half a step behind, her eyes just boring into the back of my head. And every 30 seconds I'd hear... <sighs> which, gentlemen, is international code for, hey, dummy, you realise this isn't a shoe store, let's get out of here, OK? So discretion being the better part of valour, I said, OK, let's go. We walked up to the front counter, thanked the volunteer on duty. I picked up a brochure from the counter and we were walking back to the ship and I was looking through this brochure and I saw a photo and I stopped and Lee said, what is it? And I showed her the photo. And without saying a word, we just turned around and went back to the museum. And we showed it to the volunteer and said, where's that? And he said, I've been working here four years. I've never seen it. It could be anywhere. It could be upstairs. It could be in storage. I don't know. So the three of us searched through this museum uh, for about 10 minutes. And it was Lee that actually found what we were looking for up a, a, um, a little corridor, dark corridor. And it was behind some paintings that had been stacked up against a wall. And it was the life boy of the Nimrod. Um, the photo had shown... Um, Shackleton presenting that to the, holding this himself, presenting it to the mayor of the Port Chalmers as a thank you for the assistance that they, the city had given them. And so to be able to hold this, something that my hero had uh, held a hundred and something years before, was, was absolutely fantastic. It wouldn't really work very well as a life buoy anymore. It's very, very heavy. It takes someone with superhuman strength to be able to lift it. Um, But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic experience. So when they got back to England, um, there was a great reception waiting for them on the docks of, of, uh, at London. Uh, Scott and, um, and Markham came down to the jetty to welcome Shackleton back. And publicly, they were full of praise for Shackleton and what he had done. But privately, and with a lot of people, they said that this was crazy. He, he was within 100 miles of the pole. If he was a real Englishman, he wasn't, he was Irish, but if he was a real Englishman, he would have gone to the pole and claimed that victory for England or for Britain at that time. So they were quite critical of him. And when that got back to Shackleton, it hurt him. But he said to his wife, a live donkey is better than a dead lion, which is quite true. He, he was very much in debt at this stage and he had to do a lot of speaking engagements. You know, you know what it's like, you've got to make a buck somehow. And um, he travelled around the country, you know, giving these speaking engagements, trying to raise money to get rid of, of his debts. He did receive a knighthood for his efforts and he did receive a gold medal from the Royal Geographic Society. But Markham made sure there was a smaller gold medal than Scott had received for, for his trip as well. So sour grapes, and eventually he received a £20,000 government grant to went to pay off a lot of those debts. He wrote a book about his experience, The Heart of the Antarctic, and that also helped, that became a bestseller and helped to pay off those debts as well. Now in the meantime, in 1911, the great um, um, Norwegian 
explorer Amundsen had reached the South Pole and he had made it back um, alive to tell of his experience. And of course, Scott went and, and reached the South Pole a, a month later, but was never able to make it back al alive. But now the pole had been had been conquered. They, they needed another challenge. And so they just, oh, by the way, when they went to the, um, um, the in, back in 2010, they went to Shackleton's hut and uh, as part of a New Zealand expedition and they found some cases of whiskey there that were still in good order. The distillery that had made that whiskey had long closed down. So they sent some bottles of the whiskey and the brandy and the rum um, to another, uh, to a, a, a scientific lab. They were able to work out what the recipe was for, this, uh, for these drinks. So they sent that off to a distillery and they now make Shackleton rum. And the proceeds of it go to the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Fund. So the more you drink, the more you're contributing to charity. It's not a bad drop either. So they needed another challenge, and the challenge that came to mind was to do a crossing of Antarctica from north to south. Uh, and this is the, the challenge that Shackleton set himself. He was going to take his vessel, the Endurance, and go up into the Wendell Sea at the top of, of Antarctica. And he was going to lead a party all the way down through the South Pole, down to the south, where another vessel, the Aurora, would have gone to. And the men of the Aurora were going to set food depots all the way up to the South Pole so that Shackleton's men could use those food depots to get south. And this was going to take 1,800 miles on this journey. Uh, I showed you the size of, of Antarctica compared to the United States before, so you get an idea of the, of the scope of, of this journey. He decided to recruit 56 men, and that was going to be 28 men per ship, so 28 for the Endurance, 28 for the um, uh, Aurora, and he put an ad in the paper. And the ad said, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, uh, honour and recognition in case of success. So how could you turn a job like that down? <laughs> But he had more than 5,000 applicants for the position on, the, on this role, including uh, two applicants who were, were ladies. And they said in their application that they were very sporty ladies. So, but unfortunately for everyone, they didn't get to go. But they chose his, his men. And I just wanted to introduce you to a, a few of those men. Um, and they're all Franks. There's more Franks in this story than at a German delicatessen, I can tell you. Um, Frank Worsley was a New Zealander um, who was going to be the captain of the Endurance and um, he was a wonderful, wonderful sailor, a natural sailor. Frank Wilde was the man that had been with him on that last expedition and his right-hand man, he needed to, uh, had to Frank Wilde with him. And Frank Hurley, who was an Australian photographer, who went on to do some outstanding photographic work on this, uh, this expedition as well. But also who, someone who went along was Mrs. Chippy, the ship's cat. Now this was the cat that belonged to the carpenter, a man by the name of Harry McNish. And because he was the carpenter, a carpenter on a ship is a chippy. Because he was a, the chippy, the cat became Mrs. Chippy. Even though this was a male cat, it chose to identify as a <laughs> Mrs. Chippy, if you like. Not that there's anything wrong with that, okay? And so the cat came along as well. So just before they left on this, this journey, um, World War I broke out, and most of the men thought it was their patriotic duty to sign up and go to the front lines to serve uh, Britain. But the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, said no, it would be much better for the morale of the country if you succeeded in what you were doing and much more valuable than having another 56 men on the front lines. So they were told to sail and they sailed on the 8th of August 1914. They came down reprovisioned at South Georgia um, at the whaling station there and while they were there they met some Norwegian sealers uh, and whalers and they told Shackleton that this year was particularly cold and that the ice had uh, come way further north and there was a lot more ice than any other year they'd seen before and they recommended to Shackleton don't go, just delay it for a year and try again next year, you won't be able to make it this year. But Shackleton didn't 
didn't have the money to be able to wait. He had to keep going. So they sailed out and headed down into the ice. And we all know what happened. On the 19th of January, 1915, the endurance became trapped in the ice. Now, when in that ice, that ice all shifts. It moves around uh, in great great hundreds of miles. So all those ice flows move around. With the endurance trapped in there, they moved as well along with that ice. And these are some of the great photos that Frank Hurley took during that time, which have become um, institutional photos. Some of the men exercising on the, on the ice. Um, so that's Hurley taking some video or some, some f uh, film footage of what they were doing. And um, there was lots of photos. Now, unfortunately, later he had to destroy most of the photos, uh, the, the plates of the photos, uh, to, to be able to get back. But uh, some still survive today. Now, they got trapped in the ice on the 19th of January, and they expected to be able to work their way out eventually, but it never happened. They became stay stuck in the ice, and on the 15th of November, the endurance sunk and was, was lost from sight forever. Well, we thought that. Um, now, the men tried to, to take the ship's longboats, the three ship's longboats, and work their way to the coast to try and make it to some other land, but they were too far away from that coastline, and this was too arduous trying to drag these, these heavy boats with them. So eventually they had to stop, and they set up what was code known as Patience Camp from November until April 1916. And every day they'd take um, uh, astronomical or uh, use a sextant to take uh, readings of where they were and how far they were moving towards the, the coastline of, uh, of Antarctica. This is another one of, of Hurley's photos at that time with Shackleton and Wilde beside their tent there. Now, in the meantime, Shackleton gave orders that the cat, Mrs Chippy, be destroyed because he didn't think it was fair for a cat to be running around in the snow like this. When McNeish found out about that, he was absolutely furious. He loved that cat. He went to Shackleton and he abused Shackleton. He said that you shouldn't be the captain. This is what you've done to us. We're now not on the ship, we're on the ice. You haven't got the right to command us. We need someone else to take command. Now, if this had been the Royal Navy, that would have been in mutiny. And Wilde himself wanted to shoot McNeish uh, for this. But because the dispute between McNeish and Shackleton for the rest of their lives... Now, eventually they did get near to the, the, um, uh, the sea and the ice started to break up. So they had to get into their three boats and try and make for the nearest land, which was Elephant Island. Um, now, they were still going through those ice flows there and you've seen some of the winds down here. They get a lot stronger than what we've seen over the last few days, a lot, lot stronger. And those, those winds propel those sheets of ice and icebergs uh, very quickly across the, the ocean along with the currents. So they had to be very careful trying to manoeuvre their way through, trying to avoid these, these icebergs from hitting them along the way. They, the night before they reached Elephant Island, there was a huge storm and uh, all three boats were separated. All the boats thought that the other two boats had capsized and that they were the only ones left. So they were very happy when dawn broke and they saw the other two boats in sight and they eventually made it to Elephant Island, uh, travelling five days, 346 nautical miles. And the credit for that, that expedition, went to Frank Worsley because the, the, he was a brilliant navigator. He got them to the island. And when they stepped foot on that, uh, that island, that was the first time in 490 97 days that they set foot on solid ground at all. But they knew that there was no one going to come and rescue from Elephant Island. There was no sealers went there. There was no possibility of a passing ship ever coming by. So if they were going to be rescued, they had to take action themselves. So, oh, by the way, on the way, um, Frank Hurley, the photographer, lost his mittens and, and Shackleton gave him his mittens and Shackleton later became frostbitten from that as well. Another sacrifice he made. 
but they knew they had to try and save themselves. And the only way they were going to do that is to try and get to the nearest settlement, which was on South Georgia Island. So they got the strongest of the boats, and the, using McNish, the carpenter, they modified it. They put a, a cover over the top of it, um, and they sealed that with uh, a, a tarpaulin, and sealed that with uh, paraffin wax and seal blood that they'd uh, got from the local seals. And then they put, they lined the bottom of the boat with rocks, these big rocks, um, to give more ballast to the boat, make it more stable, and they could move that ballast around uh, as per the sea conditions at that time. But that meant that they, they were now constantly standing or kneeling or crawling or laying on these rocks that were moving all the time as this boat moved as well. And over a period of time, they created blisters and bruises and, and um, pressure sores from these rocks, just standing or lying on these rocks. Now, they, they took off um, on to cover this 800-mile, 80, uh, nautical mile trip to South Georgia. Uh, there was going to be six men, Shackleton himself, uh, the captain, Frank Worsley, the captain of the Endurance, Tom Crean, who was a naval officer and begged to be able to go along, uh, two of the strongest men, a man by the uh, John Vincent and Timothy McCarthy, and also the, the carpenter, Harry McNish. And there was two reasons for this. If some damage had been done to the, the James Caird, the ship that they were going to take, uh, the boat that they were going to take, uh, he might be able to repair it. But also... Shackleton didn't want to leave him back there with Wilde because uh, he would upset Wilde and Wilde would have probably shot him along the way. So they set off on the 24th of April 1916. The James Caird is only a 20-foot boat, uh, a tiny little boat. There's actually a replica of it when you, we get to uh, Punta Arenas where they... Um, there's uh, a place there that you can go on a tour to. They've got a replica of the Victoria, the first vessel to circumnavigate the world, the Beagle, um, the ship that um, Darwin was on, and also the James Caird. So you can go along and see these full-size replicas there. It's really good. But six men in a 20-foot boat, along with all their equipment and food for three weeks. They only took three weeks' food because if they were going to take any longer than that, they were going to be dead anyway, so there was no point taking any more. Now, if you ask any navigator anywhere in the world, they will tell you that this is the most remarkable feat of navigation ever undertaken uh, by any navigator ever. They had to reach, they had to go to a dot in the Atlantic, 800 nautical miles away. If you were off by just a degree during this trip, you would sail right past uh, South Georgia. You and your companions would die, but the 22 men back on Elephant Island would also eventually die as well. And it all came down to Frank Worsley. He was a brilliant navigator. Now, to do... There was no GPS and things back in those days. You had to use a sextant. And to use a sextant, you have to line up the horizon along with a celestial object. In the Northern Hemisphere, you'd use the North Star or the Sun. But in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't have a, a south and Southern Star. So it's usually the Sun and the horizon. That's difficult enough to do on a ship like this, where you can go up on the bridge and you can try and stay steady and um, look at the horizon and the, and the Sun. But on a 20-foot boat, as soon as they left the beach, they were lost in the swells of this of these storms through the um, through the these waters. Um, for the whole 15-day trip, they only saw the sun and the horizon twice during that time. And both times, uh, Shackleton had to hang on to Worsley, uh, who was backed up against the mast of, of the vessel, hold him, pin him to the mast so he could try and take this sighting with a sextant. And then once you've got the angle of... Uh, the angle between the horizon and the, the celestial object, you've got to do some mathematical calculations in your head, quite complex mathematical comp uh, uh, computations to work out exactly where you are. 
which is difficult at the best of times, but you're on a you're freezing cold. You've been wet for, for two weeks. You're freezing. You're in the South Atlantic for crying out loud. Um, you've had no food. You've, the only sleep you've had was being on rocks where you haven't really slept. You've passed out. And you've got to do these mathematical calculations in your head. But he did it. It was just quite incredible. But they reached the few, they saw in the distance, right in front of them after 15 days, the Fortuna Glacier dead ahead. But before they could reach there, a storm broke out. In fact, a hurricane broke out, and they were stuck in this hurricane for two days. A, there was a freighter on its way to, a 500 ton ship on its way to South Georgia, who uh, found it in that storm, sunk with the loss of all hands, and that was only 50 miles away from where they were. But eventually, after the storm passed, they were able to reach the island, and they pulled the um, the, um, the the James Caird ashore on the 10th of May, 1916, after this incredible voyage. But they were on the wrong side of the island to the whaling station. They couldn't relaunch the boat through the swells and try and get around because the winds weren't in their favour. So they only had one choice, and that was to try and make their way across the South Georgia Island, which is something that had never, ever been done before. Now, they had no idea where they were going. They had no maps, of course, or anything like, like that. The only equipment they had is they got some screws out of the James Caird and they screwed them through the soles of their boots. They had a hammer that McNeish had had and they put a, a, a piece of metal over it and tied that onto it to act as a, 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 a ice axe of, of some sort. And the only other thing they had was a, a piece of rope around about 50 feet long. And they set, the three of them, um, Shackleton, um, Worsley and Crean, set off on this incredible journey across the ice. They became frustrated because they got lost on several occasions and had to backtrack and keep finding their way. And this was 36 uh, hours of, of travel with no sleep whatsoever, travelling 32 miles across the uh, island. At one stage, they were on top of a mountain and with, the, uh, with darkness closing in, they knew that they would freeze to death if they stayed there. They had no choice. They had to coil the rope up and they sat on the rope and they tobogganed down this mountain, not knowing whether they're going to fall into a crevasse or off the side of the mountain. But eventually, after 36 hours, they have heard the 8 o'clock steam whistle of the whaling station at uh, Stromless Bay, and they'd actually made it. So they got there on the 20th of May, uh, 1916. Uh, Shackleton immediately got a boat and went around to the other side of the island and picked up the other three men from around there. Now, in October 1955, a British explorer, a mountaineer by the name of Duncan Cass, tried to replicate this trip across the island. He was actually the very first person, because uh, others had tried to get across, follow the route of Shackleton. And he's, this was in, in, with modern equipment. We knew where he was going. Uh, he had the, all the modern clothing and everything. And he said it was just the most incredible thing that he had ever done. And he didn't said, I don't know how they did it, except they had to, which is quite right. And then they had to try and get back to the men on Elephant Island. And this took a very frustrating four months. Uh, ships tried to get there, but because of the weather, they couldn't get close. And the British eventually begged the, the Chilean government to lend them their most uh, stable vessel, which was a, a, a tug. And they took that tug and they reached the... Um, the Elephant Island on the 30th of August 1916. Shackleton was on that, that vessel and he and Worsley looked through binoculars and saw the men one by one coming out from under the boats that they had uh, that they slept under and they, they were so relieved that all 22 men were still alive. He hadn't lost a single man. Now, during the four years of World War II, this was... This headline was the only one in that four years that um, uh, didn't relate to the war, the World War I, and it told about the, um, the, uh, this great trip of Shackleton's. Now, Frank Worsley, he, um, 
He went back to New Zealand, but the war was still going. So he, he went to England. He volunteered for the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. He received a distinguished service order for an expedition. He went on to rescue some British soldiers that were trapped behind enemy lines and, and bring them to safety. He was the commander of a minesweeper in the English Channel, and he earned a, another DSO when he saw a German submarine on the surface. His ship wasn't armed, so he rammed that German submarine and sunk it. He was able to rescue the captain and all the crew, and later on he became friends with that German captain. That captain uh, emigrated to New Zealand and they became neighbours for the rest of their lives. But he went to England during World War II and volunteered again, and the Admiralty turned him down, um, saying he was too old. So he got all of his friends who were quite influential to write to the Admiralty on his behalf. And in the museum in Akaroa in New Zealand, there's a, there's a funny letter from a very frustrated uh, uh, Admiralty official. Uh, and in the part of that letter, it's saying that, you know, we've got your records from World War I, remember, and you're not, uh, you're not 59, you're actually 69. Uh, but he died in, of cancer in 1943, one of New Zealand's great heroes. Frank Hurley, the photographer, became the official Australian photographer during World War I and also World War II. He took some magnificent photographs. He was one of the pioneers of um, time-lapse photography as well. Uh, so he had a, a wonderful career. Frank Wilde, he went on to uh, go with Shackleton on another expedition uh, and also with, um, with an other expeditions with um, Mawson to Antarctica as well. But he... Um, became a bit of recluse, he got into drinking and he died in, in South Africa. Shackleton, he went back to England, he also earned, um, he joined the army, was promoted to major, he also earned a DSO when he was part of that, um, that expedition to rescue those British soldiers behind enemy lines. After the war, he wanted to go back to do more exploring and a, a wealthy man, newspaper member by the name of Rowlett, decided to give him some, some money. This expedition was a bit of a shambles. They were supposed to go to the Arctic first off and then they changed at the last minute to the Antarctic. So it was a bit of a mess, a bit of a mix-up. But in um, 16th of September of uh, 1921, Shackleton was involved in the very first talking picture in, uh, in Great Britain. And then they left on the 21st of September aboard his vessel, the Quest. And as you can see, it's sailing out of London. They got down to South Georgia. Uh, Ireland and they're reprovisioning there but on the 4th of January Shackleton had a massive heart attack and he died the following day. He's buried on um, South George Island. Um, one of his men once said, I think this is, is as the boss, which was the way he was known to all his men, would have had it himself, standing lonely in an island far from civilization, surrounded by a stormy, tempestuous sea, and in the vicinity of one of his greatest uh, exploits. Now, in 2001, they buried the ashes of Frank Wilde beside him there to the right-hand side of the, uh, of the grave there, and the... Um, the inscription just says, Frank Wilde, um, Shackleton's right hand bad. Now, 5th of March 2022, the, the endurance was found. And it was found by a man that a lot of you would have met yesterday, uh, Manson Bound, who was a, a Falkland Islander. He's written a great book about that, um, Finding the Endurance. So recommend you have a read of that. Some of you have got it here today. Um, but Roald Armisen instead of Shackleton. So Ernest Shackleton's name will always be written in the annals of Arctic exploration in letters of fire. But probably the best quote I've ever heard and probably the best way I could I'd finish this presentation is a quote from a, a man who was a contemporary of these men. Uh, his, his name was Sir Raymond Priestley. He was once asked during an interview about the relative merits of the three great explorers of that time. And he said, Scott for scientific method, Armidson for speed and efficiency, but when disaster strikes and all hope is gone, get down on your knees and beg and pray for Shackleton. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. See you in the ship.